Today, we are pleased to partner with the Black Parent Initiative to host a frank discussion around the complex interplay of issues facing black boys in Oregon and in America. But first, uh, some announcement. The uh, generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures that we put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon, Bu including Oregon Bu Business Magazine, as well as our current Friday Forum sponsors, Geffen Mesher, Eber Drolla, Perkins Cooey, Portland General Electric, and Providence Health and Services. We are grateful to those entities for their support and commitment to the mission of City Club. Please join me in giving a round of applause for our corporate sponsors. Next week, here at the Governor Hotel, our forum will explore the changing nature of investigative journalism and will ask the question, is less news bad news for Oregon? Uh, you can purchase tickets and become a member on our website. As always, City Club will be live tweeting today's event. You can follow or mention us at PDX City Club and be sure to use the hashtag City Club in your own tweets. We will be having a Q&A session following uh, today's program. Uh, members, please come to the microphone and ask your question. For all of our audience members, uh, we have index cards at your table. Please fill those out and uh, at your table and we'll collect them prior to the start of the Q&A session. For our program today, our moderator is a founder of the Black Parent Initiative, Charles McGee. It was begun in 2006, and the Black Parent Initiative addresses the continuing educational gap between African American students and their counterparts in Portland schools. Charles is their president and CEO, and he was instrumental in bringing together today's panel. <clears throat> Damon Glenn is the Vice President for Community Life and the Chief Diversity Officer at Warner Pacific College here in Portland. Dr. Glenn's research interests include the college experience, experiences of undergraduate black males attending predominantly white institutions and conceptualizing, rethinking, and addressing multicultural education. Dr. Doris McEwen is a distinguished educator who rose through the ranks of public schools, first as a high school English teacher, then a principal, and finally superintendent. Through her tenure as an educator, Dr. McEwen has made a commitment to the children and has a passion for working with staff and the community to increase academic achievement. <clears throat> She hopes to that will ensure that students in her charge are competitive with their peers. Uh, the final guest today is by Baia Overton, who has 12 years of professional experience in the field and is currently completing her PhD in social work. She has served as a therapist, curriculum developer, and culturally specific treatment specialist. She developed a culturally specific transition and reintegration curriculum for the African American program at the Multnomah County Department of Community Justice. We welcome all our guests here today. Join me in welcoming them. Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bill, and thank all of you for, uh, <clears throat> for coming today to this conversation. So uh, first to sort of set the, uh, sort of set sort of the stage for today, you know, I, I think all of us, uh, I don't uh, personally and professionally, 
uh, about three years ago, my wife and I had a baby, and we had this little boy. And uh, after having this son of ours, a lot of things became a bit more real for me. Uh, and truthfully, it, sort of the games and, 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 you know, doing this work sometimes it gets political and all the other stuff. And it became extremely real. Be one statistic, uh, one in three black boys born after 2006 will go to jail at some point in their life. I've got a son and I've got two nephews. So the conversation today for me is beyond uh, research, it's beyond uh, talk, uh, it's about a way of life and it's about my own. And so today, uh, truthfully, I believe that these are three of, of the best minds in this community uh, who both from a research perspective and a life perspective uh, understanding the complexities and the challenges, but also speaking to the vision and the dream. Uh, and how do we make that possible from a policy standpoint to sort of a practical on the ground level. So the first question is to uh, Brother Glenn over there. Uh, help start this by telling City Club and this community, uh, what's the potential of black boys in this community? All right, that's, that's a big question. Let me, let me give some context to, before I answer that. So I'm a vice president of a college, I'm a professor, I have my doctorate, and my research has been primarily on the experiences of African American males at private white colleges in the Pacific Northwest. So I study kind of cultural phenomenon and how it impacts in particular black males. New research project that I'm working on is, is hip hop culture, the complexity of hip hop culture and how it impacts black males. I say that for a couple of reasons, because I, I'm a theorist, right? I'm a theorist, I frame like the reasons why things exist, and then I try, to, I try to play those theories out. So for example, I theorized this whole kind of experience coming up here to talk at City Club, because I'm like, okay, it's gonna be a lot of white folks in the room, we're talking about black males, how can we you know, make these issues relevant to folks who may not experience them on a day-to-day -day basis? And what oftentimes happens when I talk and I talk about the challenges that exist in America, the challenges that exist in our city, and I start with structures and educational systems, et cetera. Folks who are down there are like, okay, good, how can we get involved? But then there's always a group of people that says, all right, you're just blaming white folks, you're just blaming everybody else, what about what you can do, right? So let me, let me say a couple things to that regard. Number one is this, the issues that affect, that, that affect and that face black males are very complex and multidimensional. And there's intersections through all of them. So you can talk about what schools are not doing. You can talk about the families. You can talk about the church. You can talk about the community. There are a lot of different areas where we can do research on and, and, and look at that complexity and see where they intersect. But the two things I look at is I look at colleges and I look at hip hop culture. So when I start talking about schools today and really being critical of schools and critical of educators who say or espouse that they are there to maximize the experiences of black males, but they have been socialized by that same dysfunctional system. And unfortunately, unfortunately, even with well intentions, they don't meet their needs. I'm not saying that's the only problem. I'm saying that's the particular problem that I look at and that I focus on. So I want everybody to almost repeat that to themselves. So when I go in hard on educational systems, I don't want you to say, but what about the parents? What about the churches? What about the students themselves? All that matters but my research interests are on the issues that exist in higher education and how black males uh, face that. But to go back to my dear brother uh, Charles's question, what is the potential? The potential is limitless, right? The trajectory of what black males can be is limitless because the capacity of black males is the same capacity that all young people have. But the, the, there's problems with access, there are problems with opportunities, there's problems with identity, and there's problems that I would argue with the institutions that, that say we are there to meet their needs, we're there to maximize their potential, I would argue that they are one of the main purveyors of propagating that marginalization. And until we have a real open and honest conversation about that, what that looks like and what we can do about it, we'll be having this conversation 20 years from now and the, and the data will be worse. So uh, thank you for that. So but yesterday I sent out questions and the reality is I hope they didn't really think I was gonna stick to those questions. Uh, but Ms. Doris, you know, you, you have been in the systems Damon speaks of, 
you are in the system uh, Dermot speaks of. Help set for us um, what's the barrier? What's keeping us from that potential? That's a loaded question. <laughs> I think there are a lot of barriers that we are looking at when we're talking about educating students in general and black males in particular. And I frame our barriers when I think about them in terms of a belief system about our children. So I think about the social will to make students successful. I think about the cultural will to make students successful. I think about the organizational will. And I think about the political will. Because I believe that in order to have successful black males and successful students in general, it's a matter of willpower. If I don't believe that students can learn, if I have low expectations of those young people walking in the door, then guess what? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the same is true for our black males. So when I think about the social will, I think about Dr. Ron Edmonds, who said in 1978, and think about what year it is today, that we can, wherever and whenever we choose, successfully teach all students whose schooling is of interest to us, that we already know more than we need to do that. And the fact that we haven't done so must finally rest on how we feel about the fact that we haven't educated every child thus far. That's a cry. That's a cry to our community. It's a cry to our businesses. It's a cry to our schools. We're not doing what we need to for kids. Cultural will is the whole theory about understanding the population. This morning, I was in tears when I looked at the data for Multnomah County's black males. And I want to sit back and I want to say that again. Because I looked at third grade reading and math, I looked at fifth grade reading and math, I looked at eighth grade reading and math, I looked at high school reading and math. And our black males are scoring 30 percentage points or more below their white counterparts. Parts. And that's unconscionable to me. There's problems in the organization of the K-12 system. There are problems in the political will, the courage it takes. I'm really blessed right now to be working for a governor who has that courage, who's looking at redesigning our public school system so that it's prenatal through 20. That's what it takes to move our system forward. And I know Charles is saying, why did I give her the mic second? <laughs> no, you, you know I like it. So I, I, I was going to say hallelujah will, for a second. I'm going to give it back to Charles because I know there will be questions and answers and more questions from Charles. So uh, thank you for that. Bahia, tell us, uh, so part, you know, a lot of your work has focused in community with people. So you've heard from an academic standpoint sort of, the gap there. You've heard from the school building, the will, from a community perspective. Paint, paint that picture. Okay, so, can't see that big. So, come here. Hold on. Um, you know, I think that I'm a theorist and a therapist, right? So, um, I've been studying the theory of triadic influence, and it really looks at approaching a problem or a set of behaviors from uh, three-pronged approach, community, family, environment, you know, looking at institutions, how all these things impact the child whose behavior you're trying to change. Um, but what I realized was that that theory applies to how we engage our children and how we engage in the systems that our children are currently in. So one of the things that I realized, and a, a friend of mine, we both have children that attend a school that shall remain nameless, I suppose. Well, maybe I should tell you. But um, the school that they attend, uh, we realized that with the changing demographics in the community where the school is located, meaning the gentrification, um, a school that was once 80% African American is now uh, roughly 20, 28% to 28% African American. And the African American voice, in terms of what goes on in the school, how we spend our money, how we spend uh, the PTA uh, auction, funds um, really largely was being managed by, um, I'll say, <coughs> kindergarten to third grade white parents who were very active, um, silencing kind of the idea, uh, the ideas, kind of the concerns, the frustrations of uh, 
African Americans and other parents of color. So we developed what we call the Black Family Night. And I think uh, what Dr. McEwen said was really important about having courage. The principal, we met with the principal, we said, you know, we want this to be a parent uh, initiated, principal supported uh, uh, gathering that we have. And so we want this to be something where we can talk to families, we can get the voice of families, they can feel comfortable and confident, they can share with us their experiences here, and we can start to strategize how to support our kids. Because I believe that if they're not emotionally and psychologically supported, um, culturally reinforced, then the academics aren't gonna be supported either. So, a lot of pushback. Why is it called Black Family Night? Why can't it be called Multicultural Night? Why can't you call it low achievement night? Uh, uh, we had a lot of, you know, and I said, you don't have to ask permission to have ESL night. You don't have to ask permission to have a tag night. We don't have to ask permission to have a parent initiated group to address issues that are impacting our children. So we started our first group and it was a complaint session. We heard everything from, I got a letter putting my child in special ed, nobody called me, no communication, they called my kid a gang member. I mean, we had everything. And we started to put together a plan for reinforcing them. We had teachers who came out and said, I will help do prep work for these African American kids, not in a tutorial program, but in a scholars program. We will come and we will work. We reframed everything that these boys and girls uh, the way that they viewed that school, we made it more welcoming, we recognized them, we uh, put together training that the principal, once coming to our meetings and seeing this wasn't just complaints, this was real stuff that was happening in his school, committed to making training happening for his faculty. And we have, in our school, improved, we've seen the, the uh, achievement gap close over the past three years that we've been in, in existence. We didn't do anything specifically academic. And this was all because the parents came together. Parents who don't feel comfortable in PTA meetings, parents who don't necessarily know how to communicate with the teacher when they've hurt their child. And we emp empowered them. We kind of talked to them about, what do you want to do? And you can do it. And once they did that, we're seeing the gains behaviorally, academically at our school. And so I think that the community has to stop waiting for people to support their children. And we have to find ways to engage our families in a meaningful way and get their voices Recognize they know their children better than, than any teacher or principal can, and they know what their capacities are. And so engaging them in the discussion, I think, um, changes the whole game. So, Ms. Doris, can political will be inspired? I hope that pol political will can be inspired. Um, I try to inspire political will by asking people to have the courage to stand up. I think when you look at the data, when you look at the data, I was just looking at the front table here, and I see three wonderful looking black men in front of me. One of you are not going to be successful. So in terms of inspiring political will, which one of these three will you choose to be unsuccessful? And then in terms of inspiration, think about the impact on the Oregon economy when we lose one of them. That should be inspiration enough right there. I used to tell people when I was superintendent in Washington State, you need to support our students. It takes more money to house them in prison than it does to educate them. The data is there. For example, in New Jersey, it costs $37,000 a year for a student to go to Princeton but $44,000 to have a student incarcerated in the New Jersey state prison system. So if that's not inspiration enough, then let me tell you about personal stories, personal stories. I have a son, and every day, Charles sent this question, he may not ask, ask it, so I'm gonna <laughs> answer it. <laughs> so I'm gonna answer it right now. He asked me what was my greatest fear about my son. My son's 37 years old, six foot three, good looking. He looks like his mama, <laughs> okay? Good looking young man. He graduated high school, 3.9. He was a blue chip athlete. He graduated from Miami of Ohio after playing football. 
He has been a successful businessman working with Newell Rubbermaid since he graduated from college in 1998. So by all standards, pretty successful young man, right? My biggest fear is that he will end up in prison, not by his choice, but somebody else's mistake. That's my biggest fear for my son. He's profiled if he walks through a store, right? He has to have the right kind of dress, otherwise somebody's gonna follow him around the store. When he was in college, he had the police pull him over, I get this call, my son's in jail. I'm like, what in the world is going on? So he says to me, they took me to jail because I had an accident a year ago and I didn't have the insurance document from a year ago. Now this is my car that I bought him, right? I have the insurance documents, current insurance documents. How many of you out there keep your past insurance documents? When it expires, you throw it away and you put the new one in the car. That's what he had in the car. So he went to jail for having a new insurance document in his car. That's what I'm talking about when I say profiling black males. That's unconscionable. So every day, I thank God that he has a job and that he's not calling me from prison. It could be any one of our sons when you have a black child. That's so, my biggest fear. So, so Damon, uh, talk about that, uh, sort of this stuff here and tell us about hip hop's ability. How, you know, so a lot of these folks, like I look at the Portland Public Schools table. Uh, a lot of them are educators. Uh, a lot of them are policymakers. How does hip hop connect with this? All right, so I'm gonna answer that as a, as a 1B. I have to respond to something that you said, okay? So Charles and I were on OPB's Think Out Loud. Was it, what was it, Tuesday? Tuesday or Wednesday. Tu Tuesday or Wednesday. And Charles kind of had the segment. He was talking on the segment before I got on. And we were, they were talking about the, the Trayvon Martin getting killed. And I think you referenced uh, President Obama saying, you know, I could have been Trayvon. And, and a lot of kind of pundits kind of went in on him and said, you know, that's, that's not true. You're the President of the United States. You couldn't have been a Trayvon Martin. Trayvon has this, this past history of dot, dot, dot. But, but this is true story. So. Trayvon Martin, everybody understands, he got killed by George Zimmerman, and kind of the, the short narrative is he was buying some Skittles and he was kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time. What's very interesting about this story is when I was finishing my doctorate and I was in the last month of writing my dissertation right before I was about to defend it, this is a true story. I don't know what it was, but I wrote my dissertation between the hours of midnight and five in the morning, and for that last week, I mean month, every other day, I, at about two o'clock in the morning, I wanted Skittles. This is serious, this is like five, six years ago. I wanted Skittles, and I was living in North Portland. I would always go to the 7-Eleven, buy my house, two o'clock in the morning, right off the computer, finishing my last chapter on recommendations for policymakers and educators on how to support black men, with a hoodie on at two in the morning, buying Skittles. True story. And Every time I got out of my car, I would, I would get out of my car, I'd have my hood on, but I'd take my hood off right before I walked to 7-Eleven because I didn't think it was a good look for a black dude with a hood on to be in 7-Eleven at 2.30 in the morning. Like, I'm, that's just pragmatism, right? That just doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't care what color you are, take your hood off, right? So I did that, but, but I always drove, got back in my car, and went back to my house. And the 7-Eleven's like a block and a half away from my house. What if I decided to walk, okay? Here I am. I'm a professor at the time. I'm a professor at George Fox University. I'm finishing writing my dissertation, and I'm buying Skittles. If I was walking back home with a hoodie on, and some white random dude or whoever was like, hey, you know, what are you doing? My first response is, I'm doing me, you're doing you, let's keep, it, let's keep moving, right? Now, if this person like jumped out the car and was like, yo, who are you? You need to defend yourself. All that to say is, I could, I could get shot, you know? I could get caught up in something because I'm not wearing a suit, I don't have a PhD around my neck. This stuff is like real. Like, these are things I had to think of. So, yeah, I'm a theorist, yeah, right, yeah, I'm a vice president of a college, but at the end of the day, on Saturdays and 
whenever I'm not in a suit and I don't have a microphone in my hand and I'm, people are associating me with any other black stereotype, any other superficiality that they have about the black male experience. So this stuff is personal to me, even though I write about it. But now, 1B, about hip hop, <laughs> right, context. So what can hip hop do? I'm doing some amazing research right now on, on hip hop culture. And when people hear hip hop culture, the first thing they think about is rap music that they hear on the radio and it's pathologized and it demonizes folks and it objectifies women, it's hyper-masculine, it has an unhealthy obsession with material consumption, no thank you, not interested in it at all. And actually, they'll probably say that's one of the reasons why black males have problems. Absolutely wrong on all accounts except for the mainstream commodified co-opted message of hip hop that you hear on the radio does have those things. But for me, I don't look at just rap music and how it's commodified and what you listen to on the radio. I start at the beginning with hip hop as a postmodern cultural art form and aesthetic practice. I frame the whole context of hip hop that is post-industrial and it comes, it, it, it challenges knowledge claims from the enlightenment period about objectivity and neutrality. And it starts off with the ongoing critique of urban realities. And through that context, a lot of things emerges. So it's a revolutionary form, but the commodified content has some issues. But here's the complexity of hip hop. Even in the, what I call the nihilistic responses to social circumstances in the music, there is amazing social commentary and social critique that is written with kind of what I call existential and spiritual angst. Black males, even in their predicament, trying to make sense of meaning, being, and purpose. I could keep going on with this, but I'm going to say one line of a rap song. I'm not, I'm not a rapper, but I play one on TV. But this is, this is what I'll say. Kanye West before the whole Kim Kardashian stuff to me was like emblematic of the complexity of the black experience. Now he's, he's on some different stuff. But, but, but before that, I love Kanye. I just don't like his new stuff. But, 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 but what I'll say is this. Kanye has this song in, You Can't Tell Me Nothing. And this is what he says. The first line is amazing. He says, I had a dream that I bought my way to heaven. Okay? And Kanye is, in his narratives, it's always about um, materialism. Kanye talks about materialism, kind of some middle class living stuff. But his first line, he says, I had a dream that I bought my way to heaven. Which is interesting if you kind of deconstruct that. This guy's reality is so challenged that I have to even dream to get out of it, right? I got to dream my, myself to heaven. But then the next line, he, he admits that he's, he, he's, his whole idea has been commodified by materialism. So he says, I had a dream that I bought my way to heaven, but when I awoke, I spent that on a necklace. You know what I mean? That's a crazy line. <laughs> I had a dream that I bought my way to heaven, but when I awoke, I spent that on a necklace. So he's talking about that existential spiritual angst, but still being consumed by the hyper-materialism of our world. How can hip hop help? In a lot of different ways. You have to look at the complexity of it. Challenge it when it's wrong, but there's so many spaces and tropes in there that I think can provide some rote analysis to urban living. All right, so you are a, a, a teacher at Vernon, uh, Vernon, and you have a young black male in your class. How do you use hip hop? Okay, so I'm a hip hop theorist, not a hip hop pedagogue, but I do have some, <laughs> I do have some responses to that. The first thing that I think is, it's about identity, right? I don't think you can do any, any work um, Sister Doris talked about that. You can't do this work without talking about identity. The first thing that I, I actually used to work at Vernon. So I, one story, I'll, I'll real fast. So I used to work at Vernon, and I had about 50 students. I was counselor. I had about 50 students that I would work with, and every year I would do their career goals, and I would ask them, "Well, what do you want to be when you grow up?" Second grade through fifth graders, everybody wanted to be a rapper, a singer, a ball player, or an actor or actress, right? And I'm like, okay, first year I'm writing this stuff down. This is what they want to be. Second year, I was like getting, I kind of wrote it down, like I'm kind of getting tired of this, like everybody's not gonna be a rapper, everybody's not gonna be a ball player, whatever. So then third year, and this is second through fifth graders, what do you wanna be? Wanna be a rapper, wanna be a ball player, wanna be a singer, wanna be an actor, wanna be an actress. And I finally said, I, I did my own kind of qualitative research and I said, why are these kids wanting to be these things? Now, my first thought was, well, this is what they see on TV. They wanna make money. This is what they see as successful. Nah, nah, nah. When I went deeper, the kids basically said, these are the only forms 
they didn't say mainstream society, but these are the only forms in mainstream society where I can be black and successful. So their whole identity of what blackness was was very, very narrow. And so, the, so what would I do as a teacher at Vernon? I would validate the fact that hip hop is a legitimate art form and that people are being consumed by it, but I would challenge some of the, the, the messages that can reinforce the same things that we're trying to help. So that, that for starters, that's what I would do. Here, you had something to say. So I have to do one C, and then I have to do uh, two B. <laughs> so one C is that I have a son as well. And my biggest fear when I read that, I thought, is that my son forgets his nobility. You know, the idea is that you are noble, you have qualities, you have characteristics, you have divinely inspired um, purpose in this, in, this, in this earth. And the idea that you could buy into something that society has presented, the lie and the myth that you are not noble. There's something around about you that is intrinsically ugly and negative and bad. Just, I had black people tell me, I was offended when you called me how many times you said black. And I said, <laughs> black is not a bad word, you know. And I think you should challenge your reactivity to black. If I said, hey, it's Latino family night. Hey, it's Asian family night. Would you have that reaction? So don't buy into the lie. And I don't want my son to ever think he's not a, a noble human being. When I was in graduate school, I did, we had to do an intervention. They didn't like me that much in graduate school, but this guy. Do an intervention. And my intervention was how to, to teach African-American males and Latino males how to survive a police interaction. That was my whole intervention strategy. How do you survive a police inter interaction when they stop you? How do you survive a police interaction when they come to your house? Because people respond the way, and universally when something is not just. They respond, they get upset, they throw their hands around. And that could end in your death. My husband is in the audience back there. Shout out, Sean's right there. And, uh, one thing that I love, that my son has this model of someone who knows he is noble. How do I know that he knows this? When we moved into our neighborhood, my husband got stopped by the police a good half a dozen times. My husband is well aware who he is, what his capacity is, that he has a son and a daughter to come home to. And so his whole goal is, I'm going to survive this interaction. I don't care what I have to do. It doesn't take away from me. It doesn't emasculate me because I have to survive for my child, my children. So he always would call me and say, the police are stopping me. He'd call me on the cell phone and say, if they kill me, you'll be paid. And put the phone on the dash, <laughs> put the phone on the dashboard and make me listen. And I'm on the phone with the cell phone and the other phone. I don't know who I'm going to call because I'm going to call police. I don't know who I'm going to call. But I got the other phone. And he says, sir, I have my, got the hands at 10 and 2, of course, and my, uh, my wallet has my license in it, is in my bag. My bag is behind my seat. So if I have to get my license out of my wallet, I have to reach behind my seat and get my wallet out of my bag. I'm reaching behind my seat to get my bag. I'm reaching to get my wallet out of my bag. This is what he's doing. Now, it's real calm. It's clear. Did you know that you were supposed to signal within 20 feet and not within 30 feet or whatever it was? No, sir, I didn't know that. No, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. Now, I'm mad that he's having to go through this. But he's not mad. He's surviving the situation because my husband knows that he is noble. He knows this. He doesn't have to convince this, this police officer that he is. This is an unjust situation. He should be mad as hell. But he knows who he is. So long as my, my, my brother got beat up by the police and for walking down the street with his friend. They told his wife friend to move out the way because they didn't want him to accidentally get shot. So, you know, we know this happens, but part of it is he could get through that and come home to me and know that he's a man look in my face and I'm proud of him because he knows who he is. It's, I want my son to always know who he is. That's the most important thing. You are noble. You are full of inestimable gems that we are going to mine and they are going to shine and they are going to reflect all that your capacity um, allows them to. That is, that is what my biggest fear is he'd forget that or that somebody would convince him somewhere that that's not who he is. So that's my biggest fear. And I'm not letting that happen, but that's, that's my biggest fear. The other thing is, hip hop for me, growing up was always positive, always positive. Everybody I listened to was talking about, you know, we, we, I would top my children, I left my wallet in El Segundo the other day by a Tribe Called Quest. And it was about life experiences and being black and being happy and de la soul and all the people I used to listen to. So we've just 
reintroduced those to my son. So now he's singing, I got this new song, and none of the songs are new, They're not, none of them are new. But he's created for him this feeling of who he likes, what they're talking about, we're, we're dissecting it, and he thinks it's cool, and he thinks it's, it's, it's creative. And that's the, the essence of what I think hip hop can do. We had to cut out all the other madness and bring in the old stuff um, to really put it back to where it should be. But I think it ha you have an amazing opportunity with this but the right people have to be in place to, to do it. So two questions. So uh, for those of you who don't know, part of this conversation is gonna be continued tomorrow at uh, Marshall High School, where we're having our fourth annual parent symposia. And each of these, sort of the three of these folks here will be at one point in the day or another sort of presenting the parents. And actually Bahia is gonna be throughout the year doing parent classes. And so what are you gonna tell the parents tomorrow? Uh, uh, the theme of it is saving our boys. So what's your message to parents tomorrow? You first. Okay. Um, basically, I'm going to really try to break down with parents, kind of look at um, child development first, and so they can really understand, have a clear understanding of where their child is and what the capacity is for those children. I think that people don't really understand the function of, of development. And to really look at how you can take that and pull from that with, with whatever level of education you have, you have life experience, you have lived experience, you have expertise on your child to pull that out. And then how do you connect with just one other person in your school? It might be the principal, it might be the t a teacher, it might be a, the therapist, whoever, one other person who's gonna partner with you in pulling out the uh, co potentialities out of, that, out, of that, out of that child. You want me to go next? Ms. Doris, yep. Okay. Well, I'm going to be bringing a keynote address, and I'm going to ask the parents and those in attendance to call on the elders, call on the elders. And so when I say that, this is what I mean. Maya Angelou said, still I rise, that I am the dream and the hope of the slave. So I want our parents to call on these people who have crafted for us direction, Direction. We have Langston Hughes says, I've known rivers. I have a history. I have a past. We have Langston Hughes saying, mother to son, life for me ain't been no crystal stair, but all the time I've been a climbing on. We have poets like Gloria Burgess, who happens to be my sister, internationally renowned, who ask us to wear, dare to wear our soul on the outside. So I'm gonna ask parents and those in attendance to call on the elders. I'm gonna ask them, I'm gonna make sure they know they have a voice. They have a voice in the structure of education. It is their voice that must be heard, must be brought to the table. So as we think about soccer moms, and we think about, uh, I was driving from Pendleton this morning, I saw tennis moms. I want a, a sign that says tiger moms. And that's what I want our black parents to be for their children and for their black boys, to come into the schools, come into the schools and hold us accountable. Hold us accountable for the change that we have to make in order for our children to be successful. So that's part of what I'll be talking about, <coughs> but just like Charles's questions, you never know which direction <laughs> it may go tomorrow. Yeah, so my, my talk tomorrow is gonna be about just how to help parents prepare their black males for college. I think in the public conversation, there's, there's so much focus on K through 12 education, which there needs to be, about getting students to graduate, which there needs to be. And some folks feel like once they graduated and they start college, like they, they made it, but there's a lot of challenges to persist. There's a lot of challenges to get uh, black men to college. There's a lot of uh, challenges to get them to persist. And then there's a lot of challenges just that when they graduate, they still know who they are and then they can give back to their communities. So uh, based on my research, and I wrote it in a book as well, I'm just gonna talk with parents about how, what to look for when you're deciding on what colleges to decide on and what programs need to exist at the college level and how to maintain the sense of black identity, not just maintain it, but evolve it. Because the reality of it is, is I am 
I'm the Chief Diversity Officer for Warner Pacific College and I oversee policy, but also oversee the person who does the multicultural student programs. And we do a lot of cultural, cultural groups. And a lot of people think those cultural groups are just places for uh, different ethnic minorities to come together and then just stay siloed. But the reality of it is, is these are spaces for you to develop your own identity so you can more effectively build bonds across cultural differences. So that's the kind of work that we're gonna be talking about and engaging parents in tomorrow. Thank you all. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for your uh, insightful comments and uh, frank discussion. It's a very important issue for, for this city. And now if you have a question on an index card, please hold it up because we will have uh, City Club staff come around and pick them up. Uh, we will now take uh, questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at Friday Club forums is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. But we will, uh, if you do have a question and are not a member, get it on that index card, because we will be asking uh, questions from those index cards. Uh, before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and only ask one question and ask your question as succinctly as possible. And um, you don't want me to have to hold up this sign. Virginia Cornyn, City Club member. First of all, thank you all for what you're doing. None of you have talked about the students who've already fallen out of the system. And um, I hear from all of you the power of words and the power of attitude. And so my question is, are there ancillary programs that are helping the students who've already ended up in jail or who have already dropped out of school to help to learn the power of words through hip hop or through whatever method and the power of attitude so that they can come back on track and become what they are meant to be. Whoever will be here. Um, I think that um, for me, I'm working to rework the curriculum that we wrote for the African American program for Department of Community Justice, which was really shaped to kind of weave these themes around um, your culture, your identity, your nobility inside a curriculum that would kind of help you um, self-reflect your family, um, uh, looking at your, the issues that existed in your family, the, the, the kind of themes that um, exist in your family to look at what might help you be more successful. It's a transition program. It's for people who are about a year out from um, being released back into the community. Um, helping them transition effectively and then supporting them once they're in the community. And I think the more programs that are that way that also really focus on it, um, we, what we really looked at the, the kind of um, social, cultural, emotional needs of those, of those kids or young adults. But really, the academic part of that is something that we're kind of reframing now um, and some other curriculum we're trying to develop to enhance, basically to make sure that they have a chance when they get out to get back into some trade, some sort of, um, you know, something that doesn't drive you back to what helped you survive in the first place. You have to have some way to live. So we're trying to help people get the skills that they need um, and as we're redeveloping that curriculum. So there are some existing programs that are trying to look at those things and, and apply them. I have a colleague at the State Department who's working specifically um, through the Youth Development Council that would address some of the areas that you're talking about. Um, and we call it opportunity youth. Um, how are we going to impact students who are incarcerated, students who are headed to incarceration for alternative programs? My mind always goes back to prevention. How do we make sure our students don't end up in the system in the first place? But once they're there, yes, go ahead and applaud on that because that really, <laughs> That really is our key, and not only is it our key, it's our belief. It's our belief that will help us turn that around. But once they are in the system, 
we have to make sure that we are using equitable policies, for example. I did a presentation recently at the um, Oregon Juvenile Justice Directors Association, and the, the thing that disturbed me most was the blaming of the education system rather than the responsibility I have when a young person walks into me who may be incarcerated, I'm still looking at them through a different lens. You know, that has to change no matter where we are in the system. It has to be different for our kids. A question uh, from, the uh, from the floor on an index card. Uh, has any consideration been given to developing all male faith-based schools as a possible solution? I don't know about the Portland area. I uh, guess I'm new to Oregon. I've been here about a year. I can tell you that there's a very successful all-male academy in Chicago, and many of you have probably read or heard about that. I do think that those are options for youth, but I think the other piece is that let's not isolate populations, okay? We have to learn that either way we're going to end up in the same salad bowl, okay? So our responsibility then is not to put kids in a separate academy because we think they can learn better there. Why not change our attitude and our uh, instructional strategies within the system. Organizational will is about changing the structure. We often say our kids are the blame. We call them at-risk kids. There are no such thing, there is no such thing as an at-risk kid. No such thing. The system has put them at risk. And every time we call them at risk, guess what? We're tearing them down more and more and more. And so we have to think about what is our adult responsibility to change the system that we put kids into that has been unsuccessful for them. So I thank you for the question, but I am not, a I'm not in favor of putting kids in isolated environments. So I just have one thing. Yeah, I agree. And at the same time, I look at, I went to University of Oregon. I also went to Fisk University, Historically Black College. And I will say that being in that particular, having the, 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 the cultural isolation for me, which was not an, uh, it's not, it's a very uh, temporary, uh, non-representative of your life experience, but I will tell you that it was a very different experience to be in a place where the expectation, and I do believe the expectation should be that way across the board, but I'm also kind of an and, both and, I think that having a chance to be somewhere where the expectation is that you will succeed. The expectation is that you are noble. The expectation is that you're not just gonna do what's necessary, you're gonna completely, you know, you're, it's just, it's a different environment. And when you have that on a consistent basis for any su substantial length of time, I was there for three years, and I thought I was a good writer until I was a good writer my whole life. And my professor said, constipated thinking, horrible, terrible. Who, these white folks told you the wrong, you know, and you are not a good writer, and just because you can put sentences together. But the idea that, you know, he had this expectation of me, I came out of there being such a, a, a much better writer, and that helped me everywhere that I went. But I think, I think there's a, there's sometimes you need a break, and you don't have to worry about, you know, girls, you're gonna worry about, it's because I'm black, or whatever it is, you can just focus on what I, I'm capable of, you know what I mean? I think, George. I don't, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that, and most of my money went to Howard University <laughs> for my daughter, I'll tell you that. So I don't Sorry. disagree with that. What I don't want to do is I don't want to give anyone an excuse right. to say, let's just put them over there. Right. Right. That's what happens in our schools right now. Let's just put them in special education right. because I can't teach them in the classroom. You know, we can't do that to our kids. So I just don't want to give you any excuse. And, and I think it, it, it shifts the responsibility, right? right. It's, it makes it your problem and their problem. And so, Doris, I, I think that's right. I just, I agree. <laughs> Toya Fick, uh, City Club member. As y'all can see, I'm pregnant. I'm going to have a boy pretty soon. Not today, but pretty soon. 
Um, and my husband and his extended family are not African American. They were, my, ex, my husband was on OPB with you earlier this week. Um, one of my biggest fears is that my son will only identify with me because I'm the only other African American person in his family in this area. How do I make sure that other folks, other members of our family, other folks in general, um, are, are interacting with him in a way that makes him feel comfortable, makes him feel loved and supported in a way that you know he can go in and talk to them about issues that they may ne have never faced before. Um, I, I just I'm, I just worry that he may feel like I'm the only person he can talk to about these kind of things, and I don't, I don't want to isolate him from the rest of our family. So any thoughts or you could have about that would be awesome. Well, I just told Bahia that's that you answered that because you're good at that. But but I do want. <laughs> I do want to say that the first thing that binds us is our humanness, our humanness. And we have to always remember that. And then, you know, so while you're bringing him up uh, in the humanness part of it, it's to also teaching him about valuing, honoring, and being proud of his culture. So I have, um, you know, I have two, I hate to use the word interracial, you know, but I have two nieces that are not, um, nobody's full blood, anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's hard for me to describe, but I have two nieces who have fathers who are not African American. Okay, I'll put it that way. And you know, when they were really young, um, I had one niece who would say, I have one black mama and one white daddy, you know, and my sister and my uh, brother-in-law helped her to circle back to who she is, to value her as an individual, value your African culture, value your Celtic heritage, value all of who you are. You know, I think about my heritage, I'm African, I am uh, American Indian, I'm Scott-Irish, I have this huge cultural mi mix, and it's made me who I am. It makes me who I am, so valuing that. But I know Bahia will have more specifics for you. So, you put me on the spot like that. Well, I would, I would say that um, really it's gonna come down to how the family frames these things. It's not on the child to make them comfortable for what, with what he's gonna be experiencing. It's for them to recognize that they're not gonna understand completely and that he can feel supported in wanting to talk to you about those things because he recognizes that you would, would be able to relate to that. So that they're not bent out of shape that he didn't come to them, that they could say, you know what? I can imagine that that might really be really frustrating for you. I've never experienced that. How might, maybe you should talk to your mom. Maybe, maybe your mom has someone who, who's had a similar experience and th them not to feel like they're failures and you not to feel like they're failures, but to be honest. Otherwise, if they go to them, they go, I can tell you, don't worry about that. Ignore those people. You know, that kind of thing is not helpful. Um, for a child who's trying to navigate. So I think for, for him, he is, society is going to basically decide, determine, depending on how he looks, who he should, who they, how they should um, address him. And you're gonna, the family's gonna have to, I think prior to the birth, if you could get it in, have a discussion about how you will handle these things and then hold everybody accountable to that standard. We need a question on hip hop up here, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanna talk about. Sorry, I don't got one for you. Matt Keenan, City Club member. Each of you shared a story about racial discrimination and profiling from police officers. I'm curious, when it comes to criminal justice reform, how much of the problem is with police officers themselves and how much of the problem is with the system as a whole? I think the police officers help create what the system is and what the, I mean, again, people go into enforcement for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I don't think that you can weed out a lot of those reasons in the psychological evaluation that they do for police officers. And I think that what becomes the culture of police policing and enforcement becomes what this, the, those are the pillars of what the system is. So I think that yes, it, it kind of begins, there's a lot of community police who are good, but the overall idea, if you read a book, actually the book Breaking Rank, Norm Stamper, that man, he was a, um, he was a police chief of Seattle and San Diego for over 50 years, and he has a whole chapter called uh, Why White Cops Kill Black Men. Whole chapter on it. It's really interesting. Anyway, you should read that book. That I would recommend it, because then you can understand how insidious um, 
and pervasive this uh, profiling and how people view the people they're policing. Are you serving or protect? Or are you, you know, are you, is that your whole purpose? Or, or are you really actually instilling fear and harassment um, in communities? So I would read Nord, Norm Stamper. Well, I'm pretty sure people heard this data before that based on third grade test scores, it projects how many prisons they, they're gonna build in, you know, in 20 years. And so that data is very, that's not just alarming, that's not disquieting, I mean, that's a crisis if it, if it is true. And, and the, rea the reality of it is this, is that we are making first class prisons and second class schools right now. There's a lot of investment and money to be made in the, in the school system, I mean in the prison system. And, and so we need to look at that reality. People are projecting, they're making money off these prison systems and they have to find ways to fill them. And in states like New York and these stop and frisk laws and curfews that they're, that, that they're invoking on different communities, they're essentially making it illegal to be young, black, and outside. You know what I mean? Like, or you're gonna have some problems. So I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a both and argument as always. We don't wanna make it just this Western construct of an either or, but I do think that this system is creating a particular type of, type of cultural environment and ethos that is just almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that part of the system has to be training police officers uh, about attitudes and uh, well, the same wills that exist for education exist outside in the community as well. And I think it's, you know, it's uh, telling data when New York, for example, arrests black males two times as often, uh, frisks black males two times as often. And it's also interesting that when they're frisked, twice as likely not to have anything on them. So that is telling information right there. And I think that part of that is about the attitude. I think about Charles Massey. He says, you are, what, you are what you were programmed to be when you were 10 years old. And you have to deprogram yourself. So think about the experiences that a lot of our officers have growing up is very different than the communities in which they're serving. So there should be mandatory training in order for officers to work in various parts of our city, whether it's black males, Latino, whatever the population, there should be specific culturally responsive training. Thank you. Uh, we have run out of time for uh, further questions today and we'll have to stop for the day. Uh, please join us next week for the Friday Forum, if less news is bad news for Oregon. And as we close today, please join me in thanking our guests, Charles McGee, Damon Glenn, Doris McEwen, and Bahia Overton for a great presentation. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.